You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Grant, we've gotten a lot of reaction to our conversation with Haley. She's the poet in Minnesota who wondered if there weren't more terms for the seasons than just winter, spring, summer, and fall. The times between the seasons where something weather-wise is happening, but it doesn't really fit the other categories. Mm Mm-hmm. And it turns out that there are lots of terms for those mini seasons. We heard from David Alice in Burlington, Vermont, who says in his state they also have something called stick season. And stick season is once the leaves have all fallen and there's no snow on the ground yet, typically in November. David says, I suppose because autumn is so spectacular here that it's quite the contrast when the leaves are suddenly down. The forests look like big sticks. And he says he'd never heard of that until he moved to Vermont. And we also heard from Linda Lavalette, who lives in rural Upper Michigan, and she said we refer to the time between winter and spring as mud season. <laughs> we, heard, we heard that from more than a few listeners. Mud yeah. season is very popular around the country. I don't think they throw parties, but they, and they don't look forward to it. No, not at all. And it, it reminds me that um, that in Old English, before we started using the term February for that second month of the year, uh, there was the term Salmonoth, which may mean mud month, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, as, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, mud month. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is good. What do you call the other seasons of the year? Not winter, spring, summer, fall, or autumn, but the times in between. Let us know, 877-929-9673, toll-free in the U.S. and Canada. Or email your thoughts, ideas, or questions about anything having to do with the language to words at waywardradio.org or talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, how are you? Uh, My name's Natalia. I'm calling from Rhode Island. Yeah, we're glad to have you, Natalia. What's up? So I had a question about a phrase that we always used to use in my family, and it's when you're driving behind a car for a really long time on the highway and you develop kind of a relationship with them. And it's always for a car that's really reliable and they're driving the speed limit and they're very safe and you can just kind of follow them for a long time, sometimes hours. And we always used to call them the follow John, like, um, oh, you know, we've got a great follow John in front of us or um, looks like our follow John is exiting. So we're going to have to find another one. And every time that you had to leave or they had to leave, it kind of felt like you're breaking off a relationship. Um, <laughs> and I <laughs> and I just realized that we might be the only people in the U.S. who use that phrase. It kind of came to us in a, in a funny path. Um, and I didn't know if there was another word for it that we could use that maybe other people <laughs> will understand and relate with. You said there's a story about Follow John and how it became a family expression? Yeah. So so we're all originally from Poland. Um, and before we moved to the U.S., uh, my family lived briefly in Sweden. Um, and they had a friend who owned just like a little sailboat. Um, and every time that he found the sailboat that seemed to actually know what they were doing <laughs> and how to navigate in the water and where to go, um, he'd always yell out, Follow John! Um, And so then it caught on with my family. When we moved to the U.S., we kept it. Um, And when we would use the phrase uh, on the highway, it was always the only English phrase in what was otherwise a Polish sentence. Um, And for years, I thought that that's just what Americans call that car. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) And I no longer think that's the case. (laughs) I have never heard it, Martha. No, this is follow John, <laughs> J-O-H-N, right? Like J-O-H-N. Well, I mean, I, I don't know because it came from a Swedish person into our Polish family and into the U.S. So I, I don't think there's a correct spelling. We only ever said it in the car. Oh, okay. But but it's <laughs> but it's like somebody's name, it sounds like. Yes. Although, yeah. although it was never John, it's always the name of the car was follow John. Right. Yeah. Like a compound. Yeah. <laughs> like a compound, right. 
<laughs> Gosh, no, I I have never heard of this. I, it, it does remind me of, I have a friend from childhood who was on a really long drive to Florida, and he and this other woman kept passing each other, and, and they would serve as you know, to use your term, they would serve as each other's follow John. And it got to be kind of funny. And they started waving to each other and the gas gauge right. got lower and lower. And at some point, my friend John scribbled the term coffee with a question mark on, <laughs> uh, on a piece of paper, stuck it up in the window. They go to a truck stop. And the next thing I know, a few weeks later, his family is talking about Freeway Jane. And I'm saying, who is Freeway Jane? <laughs> and my friend John and Freeway Jane got married. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. I mean, it really is like a relationship that you develop, yeah. but they took yeah. it to just a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah, but you may have given us a word for this because, Grant, I'm not aware of any uh, term like follow John. I mean, I use terms with, with less kind of story behind them, like road buddy or pace car, pace car coming mm, from, mm-hmm. from car racing. And it's come up a few times on Reddit, I remember. And people there say things like car buddy or travel buddy. But these are all to be expected. These are all terms that you would create for that kind of person. But this is a shared experience that a lot of people have that you talked to Natalia about the reliability of the other car. That's so important when you're in it for the long haul. They're making good lane choices and um, they're not doing a lot of passing. And that's what you want to do too. So you don't tire yourself out. Exactly. Exactly. They make the drive easier. And then when they leave, it's like a, a little part of your drive leaves too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's there's true. a there's a term uh, coined by the social psychologist Stanley Milgram, uh, familiar strangers. This was in his mm. 1972 paper called "The Familiar Stranger: An Aspect of Urban Anonymity," and it's about this: these people that you see in your life constantly, but you don't really know. Mm. You know them and their behavior and where you encounter them regularly. And maybe even you nod or do a little hand wave or a chin jut or something like that. But all they are is still strangers. But you're a little more likely to talk to them should you be sitting next to them, say, at a, in the theater or encounter them in, in line for food at a restaurant just because yeah, they're a I little familiar. That. Yeah, familiar strangers. Mm. Well, Natalia, if anybody else listening uh, uses a term or uses follow John for uh, this kind of relationship, (laughs) I know we'll hear about it. And I'm so glad you brought up this topic. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I would love to hear what other people call that car. (laughs) Me too. too. (laughs) Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. If you've got a word for Natalia's experience of having a road buddy or a car buddy, this this vehicle that you follow and they become your friend, even though you don't really know them, but you're following them for hours, if you have a name for that, let us know, 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or tell us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, this is Diana uh, uh, from Socrates, New York, in the Hudson Valley. Oh, nice. What's on your mind, Diana? Well, I really, really love hearing about the derivation of words. And I got to think that, you know, my my mother used to um, always want to talk about, you know, having something for lunch or whatever. Or she Instead of saying sandwich, she'd say sandwich, like S-A-N-G, like a sandwich. She's Italian, and all my relatives on that side, the Italian side, all said sandwich this that way, saying, like, with a G in there. I'm like, what? First, I thought it was just her, but now they all do it. And I also noticed watching The Sopranos, the TV show, that they say that pronunciation also. And it's, so I'm thinking, is this, is this something Italian-Americans uh, like an affectation from uh, Italian immigrants, and I, I'm, or maybe it was just a New York area. I'm not really sure. I'm wondering um, if you guys have any idea how the how the G got in sandwich. <laughs> oh boy, do we! Yeah. All right, this is a wonderful little example of something that linguists have studied. And it happens wow. with speakers of first languages like Italian and Spanish when they try to say words like sandwich where they have that NDW in the middle because those sounds of that N and the D and the W, those three sounds in a row simply don't occur in native Italian or Spanish words. So they have difficulty with that. So it's not an affectation. What it is is 
they substitute those three sounds with the closest sounds that they have in their native phonetic inventory. And it's what's called a velar nasal stop, which makes the word huh. come out like sandwich. So it's a, a very nasalized, almost NG. And one of the really interesting things about this is small scale research was done in Toronto and it was found that the word sandwich, the pronunciation, starts with the first generation immigrants. And because it's largely a kitchen word, that is, it's kind of between family members, it continues yeah. to the second and third generation. Um, but people are likely to stop saying it if someone points it out and say, oh, that's not the way that everyone else says it. And nobody says sandwich in the second and third generation if their parents didn't say it. So the fact that all those other people say it in your Ita the Italian side of your family is because yeah. of those two people who migrated from Italy. And they passed it down as kind of this family pronunciation. Oh, interesting. Because I don't know if I ever said it. I don't remember if, if uh, I don't think so. Maybe when I was younger and I don't remember. But it's funny because I know my, um, my mother said that Italian, she spoke Italian before she spoke English. Yeah. And, they, and, I, and this, this said the TV show, the HBO show, Sopranos, they said it. And I was like, Oh, this is something you do with Italians. <laughs> right. And, There's and, a pattern there, here. Yeah. It's and it's funny that you should mention the, the Sopranos because that show and other shows about Italian Americans have made sandwich less stigmatized than it might otherwise be. Because people are like, wow. oh, yeah, okay, so people from Italy are of Italian American heritage say that. Okay, that's fine. And they move on. Whereas. If people encountered huh. it on their own and they didn't have this data point or this reference, they might really belittle people who said that or criticize them severely. But now, since you have a little bit of data, uh -huh. you can slot this in and say, oh, I know something about this and I don't need to criticize it too much because it, it, it makes sense to me. And so this is, this yeah. is really a, a key part of what Martha and I do here when we always say, if you find yourself angry or irritated by something about language, it's probably because you don't have enough data. Well, thank you so much, and I just enjoy your show so much. It's, it's, oh, our it's pleasure. Totally Call us again sometime, all right? I will try to think of something else and do that, yeah. <laughs> Please do. Okay, guys, thanks. Have a great day. I'll be Take care. Kidding. Bye-bye. Take care, Diane. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye. If there's a linguistic question that's been vexing you all these years, we want to hear about it. Call us, 877-929-9673. What did the grapes say when the elephants stepped on them? What did the grapes say when the elephants stepped on them? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What? <laughs> Nothing. They just let out a little whine. Oh. <laughs> I think I've got internal bleeding from that one, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. 877-929-9673. <laughs> We choose our on-air callers from among our podcast listeners. So if you'd like to be on the show, you don't have to be listening live or even be in the United States. There are lots of ways to send us a message or a voice note at waywardradio.org slash contact. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett, and joining us now is our quiz guy, the one, the only, the unique, John Chinesky. Hi, Martha. Hi, Grant. I think one of me is enough. <laughs> <laughs> this quiz this week uh, is uh, something we've sort of done before, but it's a little different. The answers to each of the following clues is a two-word or more-word phrase in which the only vowel is E. You get that? Yeah. Okay. For example, uh, it's what some people claim the moon was made of, and who's to say it's not? Green, green cheese. cheese. Yes, green Grummet. cheese. Two words, five E's, all E's. No other vowels in any of these. Now, here's the first one. This describes a classic version of a picnic blanket or tablecloth, like you might see at a country diner. Red checkered. Yes, red checkered. Mm. There we go. Two words, four E's, only E's, red checkered. This is a song by Warren and Mercer, written for the 1938 film Going Places, but it's also a minced oath that in the song 
is inspired by a beautiful pair of eyes. Jeepers Creepers? Yes, Jeepers Creepers. Nice. Where'd you get those peepers? peepers? Also only E's, peepers. You commonly find these on mirrors, where the top, bottom, and sides are not square, they're not rounded, they're not tapered. They're beveled. Yes, beveled... Edges. Beveled edges, yes, beveled edges. One, two, three, four, five E's in only two words. Very good. Now, you're supposed to add these three words to the end of your fortune cookie fortune to give it a naughty meaning. <laughs> I thought it was always in bed, but... So did I. <laughs> well, this is a sort of a more poetic way of saying in bed. Oh, is this what we used to say when we would page through the Baptist hymnal? <laughs> oh, do tell. <laughs> but what is that? Um, you just add between the sheets to all the yes. names of the hymns. That's it, between the sheets. I thought it was between the sheaves, but okay. <laughs> between oh. the sheets, six E's. Abide with six me. Six E's yeah. there. <laughs> Finally, one of the three Beatles songs that only contains E in their title is appropriate for this part of our quiz because it's over. Something end. Yeah, just use the uh, definite article. The end. The end. <laughs> the end. Yes, that's it. The end. Two E's and that's it. <laughs> The other Beatles song that fits this quiz is Help. And you guys needed a little bit of help yeah. on this quiz, but that's okay. We appreciate all the hard work you put into these, John, and we're looking forward to next week. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I can't wait to do it again. Talk to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You can call our listener line 24-7 in the United States and Canada, toll-free, 877-929-9673, or email us wherever you are in the world, words at waywardradio.org. Hey there, you have a way with words. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I'm from Virginia. And so I have a question about texting my dad. Okay. So my father, he's 75 and he's finally retired. And when he was working, he would refuse to use his cell phone. He'd always keep it off and in a drawer. And every time I wanted to talk to him, I either had to call him on a landline or I had to text my mom, have my mom tell him something. I never texted him. Emails were few and far between. Now, me, I am 23, and I grew up on the Internet. A lot of my conversations were through a text-based platform like chat forums, Internet forums, do now social media and texting. Because of that, the way I talk to people through text casually is I kind of started talking through memes. And with my friends, it was never really a problem because a lot of my friends, we were always kept up with the latest memes and we could easily understand each other in where somebody who wasn't really in the loop would have no idea. So where can I start catching them up with the latest internet memes and lingo for somebody who <laughs> has hardly communicated through a text and image-based platform? And Sarah, how motivated is he to do this? He seems pretty open about it. I okay. mean, because um, before he'd say, like, he'd be so afraid to use his cell phone. But now, like, he said it himself. I didn't prod him. He said it himself that um, after he stops working and he knows he's not going to get a whole bunch of calls, that he's willing to communicate through text. And he does want to be kept in the loop, like, when we send photos and such. I mean, memes, the way you're talking about memes probably seem to him a lot like that famous Star Trek episode, Darmek and Jalad at Tanagra. You know, it's this, this is a culture where these people only speak in allusions and references to shared culture and they don't ever say things explicitly. Oh, it's Shaka when the walls fell, Timba with his arms wide. And memes probably to him seem like that, you know, at the start. Um, so you're going to have to go easy on him and go in gentle and do memes maybe from television and movies that he's seen and knows. Uh, maybe stuff from The Godfather or, or MASH or, or Cheers, stuff like that. Oh, interesting. You might think about that because uh, uh, he'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that episode. Or, yeah, of course, that not that just like Sam Malone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but above all... Uh, just, you know, keep in mind that he probably comes from a business world where 
getting in, getting to the point, and getting out is important. And that's still important in, in social media and the text-based online world. You know, he, he probably really doesn't think of it very much as a, as a playground like those of us who grew up online do. And that might be a real change in mindset for him. Huh. Interesting. You know, if he is motivated to, quote-unquote, learn a foreign language in retirement, as some people are, um, there is that website, knowyourmeme.com. Do you know that one? Oh, yes, I'm very familiar. Yeah, that's K-N-O-W, no, knowyourmeme.com. And, and, and I find myself looking up some things there from time to time. And the other thing I'm wondering is, Sarah, have you thought about um, just using, I call them GIFs, a lot of people call them GIFs, you know, I mean, my friends and I are constantly sending each other pictures that are just, just, I think, hilarious. I mean, we, we can, we can just go back and forth and back and forth, um, one picture, you know, versus another um, that way. Do you do that? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's a little different from memes, right? But, um but uh, if you can get your dad to, to learn how to do that, that can, I mean, we've had entire conversations, my friends and I, just going back and forth sending pictures. Sarah, what, what application do you use with him? What program do you use? Um, so, so far, we're using either just regular SMS. Um, I have used WhatsApp with him before when he was traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, but before, the closest thing we really into like a text and image based platform was email and even then that just kind of has a stigma of talking formally and if email is just not really good for quick pleasant conversations or at least for me because he used his work email and at the end would be like a long legal blurb and well, the reason i asked about the application that he's using is you're going to have to teach him where to get his own things to share and how to share them. Make sure he understands how to do this. Uh, for example, teaching it, like setting him up with, um, say, an Instagram account that is uh, preloaded by you with some great meme follows, you know, follow some good memes and good sites like National Geographic or museums on topics that he likes and stuff like that. Places that are image heavy. So when he finds something that he likes on Instagram, he can share that. He knows how to do it and send it to you. So he becomes a generator of stuff to you and he feels like he's holding up his end of the conversation. So that's a key part of it. It, Teaching him how to generate his own stuff rather than just pulling from your stock of of, of memes and pictures. Does that make sense? So it's not going to be really, yeah. really meme but at least you'll say, oh, my dad thought this was a good mm. picture. I now know this little bit about my dad, that he likes this sort of thing. So it's what I love about this, Sarah, is you are bridging this intergenerational gap. And, and so help him do that by helping him share back what he likes. I never thought about that. That's genius. Well, Sarah, you have to uh, get back in touch with us in a while and let us know how you're do- how you're doing, or have him do that. And if he follows <laughs> us, we will follow him back. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Take care Thanks, and Sarah. be well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, we do try to follow everyone back. You can find us on Instagram at Wayward Radio. You can find us on Twitter at Wayward, and you can find us in email, which doesn't have to be boring. It can be fun and lively at words at waywardradio.org. Hey, Grant, did you hear about the new Dr. Doll? The new Dr. Doll? No. You wind it up and it operates on batteries. <laughs> That's terrible. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling that joke since fourth grade. <laughs> oh, boy. Tell Martha your bad jokes. Words at waywardradio.org. Hello. Welcome to Away With Words. Hi. Hey, Grant. Hey, Martha. How are you? Oh, doing all right. Who are you? Doing great. Yeah, this is Will uh, calling from Boston. Hi, Will. What's up? So I'm a civil engineer, and I'm currently working on a project where I need to design a driveway to cross a stream in wetlands to access our proposed development. And I'm working with a wetland scientist on this project, and they informed me that I needed to design the thawweg for the section of stream that we're adjusting to accommodate our driveway. 
And I was looking at this word, and I was like, this has to be a typo, because it's T-H-A-L-W-E-G. I, it's just that looks so strange. So I looked it up in the uh, technical document that uh, was referenced, and sure enough, there it was. And a lot of these technical documents have definition sections. So I was able to scroll down and find the definition for Thalweg of uh, had two definitions, a line connecting the lowest points of a stream or riverbed. And then a kind of a variant definition was the deepest part of the river channel. So uh, my question obviously is not necessarily what does it mean, but uh, it sounds like an old word. It, like where does it come from? Why do we have such a, a niche word for this type of technical definition? And yeah, just generally wondering what you guys can tell me about it. Uh, it's usually pronounced Talvig, and it is a combination of two German words. And let's dispense with the second half first. The Weg in there, W-E-G, means way or path, you know, like the path along the bottom of a valley. But the mm-hmm. tall part, the T-H-A-L at the beginning is super cool because it means valley. And you see this word, T-H-A-L, this German word meaning valley in a whole lot of German names like Rosenthal, which means the Valley of Roses, Blumenthal, the Valley of Flowers, and in Germany there's the Neander Valley, which uh, gave us the word Neanderthal, which is where they found the fossils of those hominids. But wow. wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> In the Czech Republic, there's a little town in the mountains, and in the 16th century, it went by the German name Zankt Joachimstall, or St. Joachimstall, which translates as St. Joachim's Valley, Joachim being the father of Mary, uh, who was the mother of Jesus. And in Joachimstall, that is in St. Joachim's Valley, there was a silver mine, and the silver there was used to mint coins that were called called Joachim Stallers, that is, coins from that valley. And in German, the name Joachim Staller was shortened to Taller, which eventually gave us the English word for our currency, dollar. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And there's more. I'm waiting for (laughs) it. (laughs) But wait, there's more. There's all this stuff about the land, though, Martha, right? There's all this stuff about the land because um, related to this word Thal in uh, German, meaning valley, is our own word Dale, which is a kind of valley, and Dell, which is sort of a a smaller one covered with trees, usually. Like farmer in the Dell. Yeah. yeah. And Dale, as in like the Yorkshire Dales, this beautiful country. Yes. So I'm going to take a breath here. (laughs) And Grant, did you have anything to add to all that? Thanks, Martha. (laughs) Uh, Will, you had a really good thought when you said something about this looks like an old word. It is an old word. And part of the reason that is so firmly in the specialist language of English is that it goes back to boundary disputes and discussions between different nationalities and and principalities and the language of disputes diplomacy and geopolitical boundaries so it's definitely it's borrowed from like these really sophisticated complicated international and um, geopolitical relationships so it's a super important word that um, probably will never go away it's not it wasn't something borrowed accidentally it just really specifically represents this idea so perfectly that it's been borrowed into french and a whole host of other european languages wow that's so interesting. I mean, so the, the the etymology of the word goes back in so many different directions, but the actual like river use is always about it was, it was like had boundary implications, right? Is oh yeah. It, yeah, because the because the Talveg is often uh, the middle of a navigable channel, same as the Channel Line, and that often is the geopolitical boundary between two states or nation states. Wow. The word Talveg is often used when discussing where one country ends and another one begins. So I realize I went off into all kinds of tributaries, but they're so cool. They're all connected. (laughs) Yeah, uh, tributary, a choice word there, I think. (laughs) Right. Will, so every time you see this word now when you're working with it, what are you going to think? Oh, man. Well, I have so much power right now because I'm a moving one, right? (laughs) <laughs> no, it's just a small <laughs> in, intermittent stream in this application, nothing uh, groundbreaking. But 
uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, no pun wow. intended. <laughs> You're moving yeah. a tall vig? Yeah, all of, you know, five feet, and it's a uh, very small one. I'll put it that way. <laughs> that's still still interesting. Well, I got to imagine there's a whole host of other vocabulary terms that you come across, and I am inviting you to uh, reach out to us again anytime something strikes your curiosity. We'd love to talk to you one more time about that, or several more times about this stuff. Yeah, it's fun. I You know, working in Boston, it's an old city, so I get to read old you know, zoning bylaws like and terms that came Ooh. in from, you know, you know, who knows, 1600s mm-hmm. that are just terms Amazing. that stuck around. So, yeah. Ooh. Well, thanks for spending this time with us. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah, this has been a blast. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks, Will. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cheers. Will's not the only one who encounters the language of his profession and says, wait a second, I bet there's more to this. We know you have that experience, too. Call us with it. 877-929-9673 is toll-free, 24 hours a day in the United States and Canada. And, of course, you can always email us, words at waywardradio.org. a word that was recently added to at least one dictionary in Italy, and the word is umarel, and that is a neologism for a concept that's been around for a long time, and umarel is a kind of older gent, and the Zingarelli Dictionary says something to the effect of an umarel is somebody who strolls around at construction sites checking, asking questions, giving suggestions, or criticizing the activities that take place there. And the dictionary definition describes that person doing all that con le mani dietro la schiena, which means with his hands behind his back. I mean, you've seen these guys oh, outside yes. of construction they're, sites. They're universal in the world over. <laughs> He's rich. <laughs> tired he's got nothing better to do but look to see what these young mm-hmm. these youngsters are up to and just kind of tsk 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 you know uh-huh. these ultra cockers uh, right in new york <laughs> right. just standing there and uh just uh, kibitzing from the behind the right. fence. <laughs> Giving advice. <laughs> yeah, the word umarel is from a dialectal word that means little man and it was popularized by writer danilo mazzotti perfect <laughs> We love hearing the new words from other languages. What languages do you speak? Uh, There's something new happening in them. 877-929-9673. Words at waywardradio.org. Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Grant, have you been watching Severance on Apple TV? I uh, watched the first episode with my family, and I have to say yeah. that is some of the most striking, I call it filmmaking or showmaking I have ever seen. Yes, it is the weirdest show with an amazing cast. I've been describing it to people as sort of Twin Peaks meets The Office meets 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's a fascinating program that raises the question of what if the person you are at work knows nothing about the person you are at home? You don't know who your friends and family are or what you do in your spare time. And when you're at home, you know nothing about who you are at work and what you do. And as you know from that, just that first episode is sort of creepy and dystopian, but sometimes it's laugh out loud funny. And I keep wanting to talk about it, and now I have an excuse to, because it includes a teachable moment of etymology. Oh boy, let's hear it. Yeah, once you get farther into it, there's a book that claims to give the origin of the word camaraderie. And it says, most linguists agree that it comes from the Latin camera, which means a device used to take a photograph. And of course, the best photographs are not of individuals, but of groups of happy friends who love each other deeply. Not exactly. That was actually a laugh out loud line for me, because in Latin, the word camera means room. And that eventually gave rise to the French word camarade, which means somebody who shares a room, a friend or a comrade. And that gave us camaraderie. And when you're talking about the modern photographic device called a camera, that's a shortening of an earlier term. As you know, probably, Grant, from doing this in elementary school, people knew for centuries that you could use a black box 
box with a lens at one end to project images of external objects. And that box was called a camera obscura, literally a dark room in Latin. And then later, when modern photographic technology came along, camera obscura was shortened to just camera. And I have to say that in defense of severance, the book that uh, professes to have the etymology of this word is sort of this flaky self-help book to begin with. But it gives me an excuse to talk about the show, which I can't seem to stop doing. It is funny how often on television, particularly, obviously not the, the nonfiction shows, but the etymologies are, are wrong, are off. And it always irritates me because I'm like, well, with a little bit of effort, they could have gotten that right. Mm -hmm. And then all the people who watched this would have had the correct etymology. Yeah, we're available for consultation. I we mean, absolutely within, are. <laughs> within the universe of this weird, weird show. Right. It, it, it fit it, because the book was junky, and so maybe the etymology was junky too. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'm going to go back and rewatch the whole thing, I think. We'd love talking about etymology and word origins. 877-929-9673 is toll-free in the U.S. and Canada, 24 hours a day. And you can email us, words at waywardradio.org, or try us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Where are you calling from? I'm in San Antonio, Texas right now. Wow, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. What would you like to talk with us about, Kathy? Well, I was uh, calling about the topic, uh, the relationship between culture and language. And um, I think you all put out a call about that. And I just think that it's interesting. I mean, we know that language is a manifestation of the culture, but I think it's interesting that language kind of helps to maintain and translate the culture. You know, here in Texas, I guess in many parts of the country, we're so concerned about losing, you know, our ethnic uh, language, our ethnic culture, but the language associated with that. And so here in Texas, you know, I'm a Tejana and, um, you know, part of the Mejia uh, culture, you know, the Aztec nation as it was renamed in the 1880s, but um, the Chichimeca tribes, the Kahangawa tribes were all here still. And we're concerned about losing the language of the, of the conquerors. You know, the language of the conquistadores, which is Spanish. Mm -hmm. But really, our, our language goes further than further back than that. And I think it's interesting to me that the Natual language is preserved in the Spanish language. You know, the TL at the end of a lot of the uh, words that were spoken by the Mahia nation were taken into the Spanish language, but they end in TE. So words like mm -hmm. tomate, camote, aguacate, you know, these mean tomato and sweet potato, um, avocado. All these words are in the Spanish language, but they actually even go back to the Mejia language. And we use them every day in our sayings. You know, we call them dichos. The dichos right. are the sayings that we have. Mm -hmm. Dichos and refranes. Uh, yes, yes. So one that, I mean, our family uses almost every other day is menos burros, más elotes. You know, which is fewer donkeys, more corn. The uh -huh. elote is corn, but that's that's the, one of the words that was taken into the Spanish language from the from the Mejia. Um, Isn't it interesting how often Mejia. the words are food words? The, 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 <laughs> yes. Uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and so many of the other words that I, I named were from food, you know, or making food. But I just think this one's really funny because we use it all the time. My mother was saying the other day how her father used to say that when one of the kids said, oh, I don't want to eat, you know, tortillas or I don't want beans. And he'd say, hey, menos burros, más elotes, which meant move over because somebody else will have it. <laughs> yeah, more for me. <laughs> yeah. Fewer donkeys, my sister, more corn. <laughs> right. And my sister and I were laughing because at every, every holiday or special event, we always have somebody that's new or a guest, somebody that's, you know, not necessarily part of the family per se. And so we always have the food that all of us know we like, the traditional food or something. And there's always a guest that says, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't eat shrimp or I'm allergic to that. And, and <laughs> to a person, we'll say, menos burros, más elotes, because we like this stuff, so move over, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we, uh, it, it's so interesting how often we use that. And the, so the, the culture carries on. I mean, it's in a transformed way, mm -hmm. but the words are there. The food heritage is there as well. Mm -hmm. Elote, right? Yes, Coming yes. from that, that word, E-L-L-O-T-L, -L -L, cob of tender corn, um, is, right. is recorded in the earliest relationships between the, the Spanish speakers and the, the Aztec 
language speakers, you know. Yes, and I initially thought it was just our family or, you know, our extended family, but then I realized, you know, in reading some of the books that are out there, Barefoot Heart by Alva Trevino Hart, she talks about the migrant families, and mm -hmm. these phrases were in there, and I was realizing, oh my gosh, these are from when we were migrant workers. My grandparents came over from Mexico during the Civil War, and they mm -hmm. were migrant workers, and my parents were, and my uncles, and they took us out to the fields when we were little. And so it's the exchange of the culture between the people that were migrating across the United States. You know, they didn't read English, but, uh, you know, my grandfather would drive from Texas up to Michigan to pick cherries and Minnesota for beets, but they'd always come back. And so there was this exchange of information. So all these dichos are across, you know, our, our culture, which is spread around um, the U.S. And it just reminds me that, you know, we're still here. <laughs> the, it's in the culture. It's in the food. It's in our everyday mm -hmm. words. And in other parts of Mexico, uh, the, the the Maya people are still there speaking a variety of languages that have existed for millennia, um, and still, you know, so practicing the the culture and the food ways and the speaking languages that helped decipher the glyphs on the on the, the <laughs> stele and the, and on the the artifacts that were found there. Then I mean, the languages changed enough, but so little that they were able to help decipher these this old written language. It was astonishing. But we still right. see the footprints of that language in, in words like chocolate, for example, mm -hmm. in English now. Or, or mm -hmm. cocoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Avocado. Uh, chili and chilaquile mm -hmm. and tamales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, all of those. He, jicama, mm -hmm. nopal, sapote. I have a sapote tree in my backyard. <laughs> there you go. You know, yeah. my uh, one of my dad's favorites was Cada Chango Su Mecate. And again, there's that Mecate, which is a rope. But that one uh -huh. just always makes me laugh because it's every every monkey, their rope. You know, and I just always think about this monkey swinging along. But he would say that to us when we'd want to do something a certain way or when, you know, he would just shrug his shoulders and, you know, give people their, uh, you know, moment of grace if they were doing something different. You know, Cada Chango Su Mecate, let them mm. do it the way they want to. But yes, these sayings, um, and my sisters and I have been thinking about, you know, putting them down and illustrating them, you know, making them in a book, because even the next generation, my nephews that aren't fluent in Spanish, know these words. I mean, they, they'll they say the dichos, you know, mm, and everybody laughs, it. because because we know they don't speak Spanish, but they know the dichos. <laughs> well, i got to say, Kathy, you're warming my heart, because with somebody like you as a, an evangelist for your culture, spreading it to the new generations and to the broader family members, there's there's no chance that this stuff is going to disappear. I mean, you sound so enthusiastic and knowledgeable about it. I mean, you are the, the truth teller, right? The truth bringer. You're you're passing this along. And so bravo to you. Oh, well, thank you. I, and I don't want to take all the credit as the only one because my uncle uh, did that award-winning documentary, Truly Texas Mexican, about our food. How about and that? Then the, ga the Gastro Obscura has some of the dichos in it as well, the, the video with that. So um, I guess I guess each generation is just conscious of passing this on. So I guess that's also part of our culture is being sure to, you know, pass our heritage to the next generation. But thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Bye-bye. Bye. What are the word ways that represent the folk ways and the food ways of your people and your culture? Share your word ways with us. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. <laughs> Our conversation about playful prayers at the dinner table, those formulaic ways of blessing the meal really fast and getting to the food, prompted an email from Al in Denton, Texas. And Al writes, A friend told me that when he was a youngster in Macon, Georgia, his family would frequently have Sunday dinner at his uncle's house. When everyone was seated, they would bow their heads and the uncle would intone the same prayer. Much obliged. <laughs> <laughs> that Straight works. to the point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the language you use around these family rituals of eating? 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Teresa from Lyman, South Carolina. Hi, Teresa. Welcome to the show. Hi, Teresa. Thank you. Hi. My mom has been saying this my whole life. And I asked her where she got it from. She goes, well, I've heard it my whole life, which is not a very good explanation. But it's choir. She will say it about people that are like odd, like are kind of set in their ways. And I don't know, is it is it a form of queer or 
Any ideas? So we're talking about somebody that wears their clothes inside out or uh, <laughs> likes funny hats. What are we talking about? <laughs> she, usually it's like people that don't eat certain foods or um, like, like she was talking about a couple um, that she knows and like no matter how sick they are, they don't want to go to the doctor and she'll say, they're the queerest people I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Choir. Got it. <laughs> That's wonderful. And have you ever seen the term spelled out? Choir. I have not. I have okay. not. Okay. But, I mean, you know, we're Southerners, so we say everything a little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, queer is a word that you will hear in the American South, and it's usually spelled Q-U-A-R-E or sometimes uh -huh. Q-U-A-R. And uh, it means, as you suggested, it means some... It describes somebody who's a little strange, unusual, and what's really cool about this word queer is that it's an Irish pronunciation of the word queer. And by queer, we're not referring specifically to sexual orientation. We're talking about, you know, somebody who's a little uh, peculiar but harmless. I mean, like those people you were describing, you know, they're... Right. The queerest people you've ever seen. And, um, yeah, you hear this through much of the American South. And what's really nice about this is that it's a lovely vestige of those Scots-Irish settlement patterns in the South. And um, so, yeah, you describe somebody as queer, um, meaning strange or unusual. Um, it gave rise to the verb phrase to go queer, meaning to seem strange or seem unusual. Um, and... Also, what's cool in Irish English is that queer can also be an intensifier, like it's queer hot outside. Really? Yeah. Is it queer hot there today? <laughs> it really, really is queer today. <laughs> <laughs> it's on our DNA, and we are um, Scots-Irish from um, Tennessee. Um, mm -hmm. is where our, my, my sister calls them mountain hoogers. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> so that mm -hmm. sounds right. <laughs> Take care now, Teresa. Thanks for oh, calling. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care now. All right. All Take right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, we aim to please and delight. There's more to the words that you speak than just their meanings. There's all these little flags attached, and on those flags are words like history, family, and culture. Call us and we'll explain your flags to you. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, this is Larry Ott from uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Hi, Larry. Welcome to the show. Hey, Larry. Thank what's up? You. My family had a couple of things they used to say, and I just was hoping you might be able to shed a little bit of light on it. The word Jimmy came. My grandma was the first one I heard use it. When there was trouble coming of some sort, she would say, there's a, there's a Jimmy cane a coming. And we were like, what the heck is a Jimmy cane? It definitely had to do with uh, storms and weather, but it also covered a whole range of other things um, that, uh, you know, say you got some family problems and you know there's going to be trouble or something. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of liken it to when Dr. Phil says, no good can come of this. <laughs> <laughs> no good can come of this. You sound just like him. <laughs> it's, it's something uh, bad that's a coming. Is that right? Right, exactly. Well, Larry, when you talk about a Jimmy Cane, usually what you're talking about is a really strong wind. And by strong, I mean a really destructive one. And we're not really sure of the origin, but it's probably a variant of the word hurricane. It's not quite as bad as a hurricane um, because it's an, it's an inland storm and, it's, and it's, it's strong enough to do some damage. It's, it's a straight wind that, that can knock things down. It's just one of these winds that uh, does a lot of damage. I'm looking at a, uh, at a newspaper from 1879 uh, that says, A perfect Jimmy Cane visited these parts Thursday afternoon, blowing the top knots off haystacks, unrooting sheds, raising outhouses, lumber piles, etc. Considerable fine real estate changed hands on that day. <laughs> Well, that definitely sheds some light on this situation. 
Well, I'm very interested that your family uses it metaphorically because I'm not used to seeing that. It's it's usually specifically talking about weather, but um, I could see where you would, um, if you're looking at um, metaphorical clouds looming in the distance or, or anticipating something bad happen, I can see how you would uh, use the term Jimmy Cane there. Well, interesting. All right. Take care, Larry. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye. There's something regional in the language that you speak, no matter where you are in the world. And we'd love to talk to you about it. 877-929-9673 is toll-free in the United States and Canada. And you can email us, words at waywardradio.org. And you can find lots more ways to contact us on our website at waywardradio.org. Our team includes senior producer Stephanie Levine, engineer and editor Tim Felton, production assistant Rachel Elizabeth Weisler, and quiz guide John Chinesky. We'd love to hear from you, no matter where you are in the world. Go to waywardradio.org slash contact. Subscribe to the podcast, hear hundreds of past episodes, and get the newsletter at waywardradio.org. Whenever you have a language story or question, our toll-free line is open in the U.S. and Canada. 1-877-929-9673. Or send your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. Special thanks to Michael Breslauer, Josh Eccles, Claire Grotting, Bruce Rogo, Rick Seidenworm, and Betty Willis. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. We choose our on-air guests from among our podcast listeners, so if you'd like to be on the show, you don't have to be listening live or even be in the United States. There are lots of ways to send us a message or a voice note at waywardradio.org slash contact.